Okay, welcome back. And I, how do I, you know, announce our next speaker, Dr. Roger Lear? What a real sweetheart this man is. Um, I first met the lovely Dr. Roger Lear back in 1999 at the Leeds UFO Conference in England, where Dr. Lear has always given a very interesting and outstanding presentation on his findings of alien implants. Since then, Dr. Leo and myself have remained friends for the last several years. And uh, actually, he's appeared twice on my TV show, Let's Talk Paranormal, with the first show being of Alien Implants, which actually won us an award back in 2003. And most recently, his second appearance discussing the now famed Vagina UFO crash in Brazil. Uh, Dr. Leo is a pediatrician, surgeon, who has been in private practice for the last 41 years in Ventura County of California, and is the author of Aliens and the Scalpel, as well as a number of other books, and has been said to be one of the world's most important leaders in physical evidence research involving the field of ufology. He and his surgical team have performed nine surgeries on alleged alien abductees. This resulted in the removal of 10 separate and distinct objects suspected of being alien implants. These objects have been scientifically investigated by some of the most prestigious laboratories in the world, such as Los Alamos National Laboratories, New Mexico Tech, and the University of California in San Diego. Their findings have been baffling, and some comparisons have been made to meteorite samples in addition, some of the tests show isotopic ratios not of this world. He has recently formed a new nonprofit organization for this purpose called A&S Research. Dr. Leah has been on numerous national and international television programs, including the 1999 NBC special broadcast of Confirmation. Dr. Lear has visited 42 different countries, performing lectures and investigations, and has recently authored and released his newest book, UFO Crash in Brazil, which is the story of his personal investigation of the Vagina Brazil UFO crash of 1996. Appearance and medical treatment of several non-terrestrial entities. He is a frequent guest on Coast to Coast with Art Bell, which I know you all know, and George Nuri, and on Dreamland, also with Whitley Strieber. So please welcome our very dear friend and the man that knows more about alien implants than anyone, well, certainly on this planet, Dr. Roger Lear. Thank you, Tracy. I don't know how I will ever live up to that introduction. I want to thank, uh, first of all, uh, MUFON in general, who, uh, which is one of the, the greatest uh, organizations in the world. And I've, I belonged uh, medically through uh, the years to uh, several organizations. I've been in practice, private practice now for 41 years. And I can honestly say that uh, nothing like this in medicine exists. You know, when I, I talk to, uh, to medical audiences about medical subjects, it's pretty dry. Um, most of the guys are sleeping or, <laughs> you know, uh, are thinking about uh, doing their crossword puzzle or something else. Uh, anyway, uh, I think that we all uh, appreciate your support and uh, that's what this organization needs, is uh, a, a lot of support. And I thank John uh, Schussler, who has just done a magnificent job since he's uh, taken over the organization. These, these conferences just get better and better and better and better. Uh, today, I had the privilege of uh, listening to uh, Phyllis Buttinger and uh, people of her caliber are needed in this organization because she is a true scientist. And also, uh, she went over a lot of material in detail. How many uh, saw her uh, this morning? Quite a few, good, good for you. Uh, so I wanna thank her again because since she's already explained a lot of this scientific detail, you see, I don't have to cover it. Now, um, but before we get into the, the business of business, um, Tracy mentioned the fact uh, that I'm out with my new book, 
a UFO crash in Brazil, the story of the 1996 Virginia case. It's got a lot of stuff in it, and I did a personal investigation. I spent over a week there, talked with uh, numerous uh, researchers, interviewed a number of witnesses, and some witnesses came forth that weren't uh, available ever before. One was an orthopedic surgeon who was forced by the military to perform a surgery on one of these non-terrestrial beings. Another one was the wife of a deceased military police officer who, at 23 years of age, young, healthy, in the prime of his life, Marco Eli Cherez, eh, died three weeks after exposure to one of these entities. So I just mention that in passing because you know, why don't they land on the White House lawn? You know, why don't, you know, why don't they come out and shake hands with you? Well, has anyone ever considered the fact that they, maybe if they did that, they'd wipe out the human race because maybe they carry microorganisms that might be injurious to our entire planet? So there may be logical reasons for the things that we happen. Uh, but I'm going to go into a lot of uh, science uh, today. Also, I have, uh, if you haven't seen it, a DVD uh, and a video, the scientific study of uh, alien implants. Uh, we won an EBE award for this as the best documentary in the UFO field. And uh, I think that it's very complete, and it offers you uh, interviews with the surgical patients, which now number 11. We have increased from nine. We have two more surgical cases to do. Uh, one uh, with an object in her neck and one in the maxillary area. And uh, we have another individual who has an object in her foot. The problem is M-O-N-E-Y. Uh, ANS research is now down to less than $300. We need funds uh, to progress. Um, the latest research that I've done has been on some non-surgical specimens. One was uh, submitted to me by this group, International MUFON, and we put it through its paces. It was very expensive, and I'm going to uh, finish up uh, my remarks by telling you uh, in detail what we did and what we came up with. Now, uh, I see a lot of different you know, kinds of patients in my office, and I had a, a lady came in uh, the other day, 83 years old, and she said, Doc, you know, I, I realize that you're you know, a, a foot surgeon, but you know, I, I have something I have to discuss with you. And I said, well, if I can help you, I'll certainly listen to what you have to say. She says, it's my husband. And I was wondering what's coming next. So maybe he's got an implant or something. <laughs> and she said, no, his memory is really bad. I said, well, how old is he? Oh, he's 87. So I said, you know, uh, 87 years of age, you know, you can expect a slight, you know, deterioration of the memory. She says, well, he's just getting terrible. I mean, he's getting impossible to live with. And I said, well, you know, really, that's not my field. You know, maybe you should consult a neurologist or a psychiatrist and so on. But one of the things that I can offer is that maybe he could write things down, and that might help him with his memory. She says, okay, I'll try that. Uh, so she left, and she came back the following week, um, and she said to me, you know, I, I tried uh, doing what she said. And she said, we were home one night, and uh, we were watching TV, and, and uh, I said, um, honey, would you go out uh, to the kitchen and get me a little bit of a dish of ice cream with some chocolate syrup on it? And he says, sure. Now, she says, you know, Dr. Lear told me, maybe you should write it down. Honey, he says, it's only two things. How can I forget? So uh, a few minutes goes by, and out he comes with a plate, and he hands her the plate, and it's the plate of scrambled eggs. And she says, you see what I mean, Doc? He forgot to bring me the toast. <laughs> so goes life. Anyway, uh, I realize that it's after lunch, and this is just the perfect kind of time to see what I've got to show you. So in the seat in front of you, in the back, you'll find a little bag. 
And uh, if you should be bothered by any of this, you know what to do with the bag. Otherwise, just shut your eyes. I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to show you 11 a little 11 minute video. So you, you know how it is after eating your stomach's full and your brain's drained of blood. You can watch the video in the dark and appreciate it. So let's go ahead and uh, roll that little video. I was skiing with some friends. I took a fall. They took an x-ray of the hand, and there was a strange object next to my thumb. Why me? I'm not a particularly extraordinary person. Why would I be tagged? I had this feeling like I was a, a, a wild animal or a, or a piece of cattle. I don't know how it's influencing my life, my thoughts, my health. I don't want that thing in me if I didn't give them permission to put it in. The object appears to be in the thumb, and it should be a relatively simple procedure to go in, isolate it, and remove it. Paul is an interesting case. We uh, took a physical examination of his uh, hand and arm. And we looked for the telltale marks of the portal of entry. Uh, we didn't see any. Am I anxious? Am I afraid? Sure I am. Will I be relieved if it's not alien? You bet. When the object was removed uh, and we looked at it, you don't really find things in the body that are wrapped with this very tight, sort of grayish, very shiny uh, biological membrane, and then try and take a surgical blade and cut through it with a knife and can't cut it. It looks like it might be an iron oxide. If we can crush it and get it to a very small size, we'll be able to really get to the internal structure more readily. The object resisted crushing, but an outside layer did flake off. This was put under X-ray diffraction, and the results of the test were curious. They couldn't match it to any of the 65,000 known substances in their computer file. It's not in our file. I'm not sure what to think about that at the present time. That's as many known substances that we have on the planet as possible. The combination of these elements could be put together by nature, they could have been put together by man, or they could be put together with a different type of uh, physics that uh, we have little knowledge of. I had this experience of emptiness, sort of like a feeling like maybe a pet had died. I'm not sure how to explain it other than the sense of something missing. I am a, a podiatric surgeon and am exploring uh, something new, which is the alien abduction phenomena in relation specifically to physical evidence. Basically, what we have is someone who alleges alien abduction with an object on their body, and then you take this object out. Here I start as a consummate scientific skeptic saying this is nothing but a bunch of nonsense, and now I have a report in my hand that says they contain objects from another world. I was coming home from a medical checkup in Denver with my wife. I, I saw the spherical shape, lights, uh, many lights, and uh, it was large. Came right in front of our car. When we did encounter the UFO and spotted it, and the events of the night started to happen, it, it was a. Uh, it was an awesome realization to me uh, to realize that we were not alone in the universe. It was something not of this world that I've seen. I do feel that this implant was from that first encounter. There was no doubt in my mind. OK, getting close. Is it a boy or a girl? <laughs> well, we don't know yet. 
Here it is, here. So let's put in a piece of white gauze. I think this is it, so we're gonna x-ray to make sure. I, I'm objective, and I don't really know that, that this is different. I really have to have it analyzed, though. You don't know what it is. He's a construction worker. I would imagine it's probably some construction particle that flew and hit him we didn't even hardly feel. And it was anyway. We just found it by coincidence and took it out. That's what I think it is. The object that we removed today uh, contains uh, or is surrounded by the same type of membrane that we have seen in the other objects. I have never seen anything like uh, the membrane which uh, surrounds these objects. It's a very uh, well-organized, uh, shiny, dark membrane which fits very tightly onto the object. And we've also had analysis of this and uh, it has uh, simple ingredients in it, but you do not find those ingredients uh, in combination anywhere in any medical pathology book. The shocks began to continue, and especially when we got the first pathology reports back on the tissue, not the tissue that wrapped so tightly the metal within, but the tissue that we removed, just the tissue around the object where it was sitting nicely for so many years, and we found that there was absolutely no inflammatory response whatsoever. And this is impossible. The next thing that we found was there were areas in this tissue surrounding these objects with large amounts of proprioceptors, which are very small, tiny, specialized nerve cells, and you don't find them there. These objects are mostly all located near the bone. This is not the place where you have proprioception. And then the next set of findings that came in were the metallurgical findings. Getting a report back from a laboratory such as Los Alamos National Labs, a world-famous laboratory, telling me the objects they looked at were meteorite samples. Then when we went on even further and found things like uh, amorphous iron without crystalline structure that was magnetic, and then finding ratios, isotopic ratios, for metals that are not from this earth, then what conclusion are you gonna come to? Since the uh, time uh, when we started, uh, we now have a total of 10 surgeries that have been performed. We have, let's say, three that have produced these little grayish-white balls that are non-metallic. We have four that are little cantaloupe seed-shaped affairs. We have another little metallic object, which is T-shaped, covered with this membrane. We have one that's triangular, covered with a membrane. Now, we have a new category, which is totally biological. Now this object was most unusual in the sense that it moved underneath the skin before it was removed. I was at my boyfriend's house. We were woken by a very, very bright light. The whole room just lit up and there was a uh, sphere in the air slowly coming down in his backyard. Who would really believe it? Not even my best friend did I tell. Who would I tell? I would just wouldn't tell that to anyone. It's too crazy. My first reaction when I saw it live in the patient's arm uh, was uh, shock. I've never seen anything like this in uh, over 37 years uh, worth of practice. It moved back and forth and up and down. You could just do anything to it. It seemed pretty odd along with the story of the thing that had happened to me, and I just thought, I'll go ahead. It just appeared overnight. There was no little thing that was growing, and it just seemed to appear one day. I do think this is related to the experience of what happened to me. Well, I tried to uh, trap this thing with a finger after I saw it move the first time. And uh, then I, as I held it there, I touched it again, and instead of moving back in the direction that it came from, it moved 90 degrees in another direction. When the doctor was trying to remove it, he was going, this is ridiculous. He said every time he was trying to snip and do things, he was saying, this is just really, really, really odd that I'm having such a hard time with actually getting this out of there, almost like it did not want to leave my body. 
that did try to move out of the way, and he had to use uh, a couple of fingers in order to sort of uh, corner it in one spot. And once it was cornered in one spot, the surgeon really reached in and took it out. And this uh, object is, uh, has a very smooth exterior, and it's uh, bivalved like a clam. that opens uh, from the middle and has a little dark line on each each side of this uh, upper end of the object. The surface of it was photographed under high magnification using a microscope uh, called the atomic force microscope and very powerful light microscopes giving us uh, some idea of the surface structure of the object. Later we intend to go ahead and begin to study what uh, chemically makes up the object and finally what elements uh, make up the object and then of course try and determine if these elements uh, have things like isotopic ratios that are not earthly. In my heart I know this happened. I know it was not a, not a dream. I know it was definitely real. It was definitely real, and I think it would just be a relief to me if I could discuss it and not feel embarrassed. This uh, last case, this is the only one I've ever seen that moves uh, underneath the skin until quite recently when I was just presented with another case. Dear Dr. Lear, like many abductees, I have had experiences all my life, and so have my parents. Several years ago, after an abduction, I woke up with a moving lump in my left arm. I never thought anything of it until now. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I might say you're the first audience that's ever seen this little short video. Thank you. Um, now, one of the things, the things that I do and things that I don't do. I don't do what Bud Hopkins does. I don't do what David Jacobs does. I don't do what the late John Mack does. Those are very fine, you know, reputable individuals, the best in the world for actually studying the abduction cases themselves. Where I come in is what physical evidence is involved, either medical evidence or implant evidence. And, we try to subject that to the most uh, scientific paradigm that there is. Uh, one of the things that is very difficult in my neck of the woods is to find somebody of the caliber of these other individuals who can work with, uh, with uh, abductees and, and try and help them. So uh, I came up with the idea of uh, really, truly uh, trying to attempt to build uh, from the ground up, including the property, a West Coast Center for Abduction Research. It's a big proposition. It costs a lot of money because we want to buy the property, the building, uh, have our own staff. Some things we'll do in-house. Some things we'll, we'll send out. But it will be a place where anybody can go and study, we can study this phenomena the way it should be studied. Um, not, not a lot of people trying to do little bits here and there, a very comprehensive thing. But uh, as I mentioned before, it takes a, a good sum of money to do any of these things. So uh, you might think I'm totally nuts, uh, but I thought of a possible way to raise the money. And uh, since I come from, you know, the Hollywood motion picture capital, and you don't know this, I'm sure, but I did spend uh, some of my early life uh, working in the motion picture industry, I am attempting to make a full-fledged um, large screen motion picture, not uh, as a documentary, but as an entertainment piece based on all the happenings uh, in this field. and doing it quite in an accurate manner. And uh, the, the idea for this is if we can get this thing made uh, and sold, uh, it will supply the money to do the abduction research center. 
Uh, we're working at the moment on a three-minute teaser. Uh, the CGI effect has already been done. It's been done by uh, an artist, a friend of mine, who worked on a lot of the Star Trek material and, and uh, X-Files. His name is Steve Neal. And we're uh, shooting this uh, with the same camera that uh, Lucas uses, which is a uh, so Sony 900 high def camera. So this is going to be state of the art Madison Avenue. And once it's done, keep your fingers crossed, and maybe we can find the money to, uh, to make the film. But I thought you ought to know. Now, uh, we're going to get down to the, the nitty gritty of the business. I'm going to try and cover a lot of material in the time we have left. I have a whole bunch of slides. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them. Some of them are just going to kind of whiz on by as I make comments. Now, uh, first of all, the Gary Lowry case. Uh, you all know uh, about that case, what's new, what's going on, and so on. Has it stopped? Well, interestingly enough, about six months ago, I got a call from Gary, and he said, you know, something wonderful happened. And I said, what's that? He said, all the activity has stopped. And I said, well, Gary, you know, I, I told you that historically, you know, in the abduction phenomenon, it just does not go on forever. Well, that lasted for about two months, and then he called me again, and he says, you can't believe what happened to me last night, and away we go. So he's got more marks, um, more uh, physical evidence. He collects stuff in jars and bottles and preservatives and so on. And uh, we're, you know, as I said, we have uh, more things uh, to analyze, magnetic effects and so on. So uh, let's start with the slides. Next. How would you like to see that in your bedroom? I wouldn't. This uh, is an image that is uh, taken off of a, a videotape uh, using an infrared sensor. And uh, each uh, frame of video runs at uh, 30 frames per second. But at the same token, um, each frame is composed of two fields. So um, Gary went out and got a um, what's called a field splitter. And we were able to see uh, three or, or four frames that had these images on it. And this is uh, one of the fields. Next. And remember, you're looking at this uh, with infrared, so uh, it does not look you know, the same as if you were looking at it uh, with room light. But this uh, comes through the wall uh, in the closet of his bedroom. Next. This is the uh, infamous uh, claw sample that we worked and worked and worked on. And uh, after it was seen by a number of people and determined there was a claw, we finally got down to doing the DNA. Next. Another view of the same object. Next. So these are some of the things that uh, Gary has drawn uh, post-hypnotically. He comes out of the uh, hypnotic session, and he's able to have a pretty good recall of some of the things that he's seen uh, during his abduction case. Next. Again, these are devices, and he doesn't know what they're used for, but uh, he draws them in quite detail. Doesn't have a clue, but these are things that he's seen aboard ship. Next. Uh, here's some of the reports uh, that we have, and uh, there are reports to me uh, coming from you know various places as to uh, everything that has to do with uh, the progress of scanning and DNA and so on, so we're just going to sail by these next. Uh, here's another one. This is uh, from uh, a scientist at the San Diego Zoo who is a primate zoologist. She spent hours and hours and hours. She thought it was a claw, you know, and she couldn't identify it, as it says here in the letter. Uh, I don't have to read it for you. I think you can read it quite well. Can you see it OK? Anybody can't see it? Yes, you can all see it. OK, next. Here are more reports uh, that have to do with the beginning of the DNA analysis uh, as they come in. Next. Uh, this is uh, a little bit hard to see, but it's a DNA gel. Uh, just show you this as an example. 
uh, during the process of discovering uh, what this is. Uh, this is just part of uh, the DNA uh, analytical process. Next. Now, uh, amongst Gary's artifacts uh, was a watch. I don't know if I told you about this before, and if I have, uh, and am I repeating it, uh, forgive me. But uh, one of the things he had was a uh, watch uh, with a leather band. He kept it on his dresser at night. He woke up one morning and the watch was gone. And so he asked his wife and his kids, and nobody uh, fessed up to taking his watch. Uh, two weeks later, uh, he found the watch just exactly in the same place where he left it originally, except the whole watch was covered with this uh, gray powder. And uh, so we, we, we took it in and we did uh, an EDX on it, and this uh, shows the, uh, the minerals uh, that are in the powder, uh, and that's uh, there, it's uh, in indicated uh, by the numbers the letters rather above, this is oxygen, silicone, and so on. Now, uh, we do this, and then we submit this into a computer database uh, for powders. Now, uh, look here, you can see this carbon peak is just absolutely huge, though it's mostly carbon. So we submit this into a, a computer da database, and it's got hundreds of thousands of different uh, uh, components and powders and so on. Guess what? It matches nothing. So, you know, you try and do this research and you don't, you, you discover different things, but you don't always have the answers. Next. Next. Now, uh, maybe we can lighten that up a bit on the screen. Gary uh, called me up one day and he said, I woke up with a black dot on the back of my hand. And uh, I said, well, you know, maybe you know, something got on there during the night. And he says, well, if it did, I can't get it off. And I said, well, did you try and scrape it off? He says, no, it, it just won't come off. And uh, I said, well, you know, why don't you bring it down to me and we'll see what it is. So he, he brought it down uh, and with a scalpel blade, we were able to detach it from the back of his hand. And this is a, a view uh, through an optical microscope. And it's kind of a weird looking thing. It's sort of a, a gelatinous uh, type stroma uh, around the outside. And then it has these uh, fibril like things or what actually look like wires. Next. And there's uh, another view showing this un unusual stuff. Next. And there's a closer picture of it. Uh, what is it? Well, we, we don't have a clue. We've sent it in uh, to get some analysis done. Uh, and so far, uh, it could be uh, animal, vegetable, or mineral. But we don't know what it is. Uh, so there's another, you know, um, he said, gee, this guy's up here showing us this stuff and he doesn't have any answers. Well, if I had the money, uh, I would have the answers because you could go on. That, that's why I admire Phyllis uh, Buttinger so much. He's able to lead these things to uh, some kind of a conclusion. Next, another view of this same weird thing. Next. Now, uh, we did another surgery uh, on a lady who had an object in her cheek, and um, we didn't know it was in the cheek because this case was originally sent to me by a dentist, and the dentist said, well, this, uh, she called me, called me on the phone and said, this patient of mine has some really weird stories, and uh, uh, you know, I hear that you deal with things like this, but I took an x-ray, and she's got a metallic object which appears to be in her gum. So I told him to send me the x-ray, and um, I looked at it, and we took it to our radiologist and then to a dental consultant, and they said, well, you know, it looks like there's something there. Certainly it doesn't belong there, but I don't know whether it's in the gum, so uh, let's uh, have her get a Panorex. So communication again, and we got a Panorex done. That's the whole mouth, and uh, that showed it up a little better, but we still didn't know where the thing was. 
you know, it's somewhere in a mouth, a gum, under a tooth, or whatever it is, but it certainly wasn't any kind of dental material. So then we said, well, the last thing here is we got to get a CAT scan. So we did a CAT scan, and well, lo and behold, it wasn't in the mouth at all, it was in the cheek. And it was in the cheek superficial to the masseter muscle, which is the muscle in the cheek. That means that it didn't go in through the mouth, it went in through the outside. But as in all the other cases, there was no scar. Next. Now, uh, this case uh, caught the attention of uh, George Norrie and his uh, producer, Tom. And so he said, can I come uh, to the site when you're doing the surgery? Because uh, I want to do a show on this tonight, and I'd like to uh, record you know, this uh, while it's going on. And I said, uh, let me ask the patient if it's OK. And she agreed. And so uh, there's George, and there's Tom. Next. And uh, these are a number of people that are involved in the surgery. This instrument here with the arch is what's called a C-arm. It allows us to see uh, inside the tissue as we're doing the uh, surgery, uh, which appear on uh, some television screens. Next. 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 Now, we mark the area uh, where we think this object is. Uh, and uh, then, we, in addition to this, we use some metallic markers. Next. These are the metallic markers. That's uh, somewhere between these uh, two metallic markers. So uh, that's where you make your cut. Next. Now, here's what the x-ray looks like. Here's the object uh, on the x-ray. Next. That one's kind of hard to see, but it's down here. Next. Now, this is the uh, x-ray device that we're using, the C-arm. And here's the two television screens. And you can see uh, what you're doing while you're doing it. Makes it a lot easier for the removal of a foreign object. Next. Here's an instrument that we have placed in the wound. And you can see it's just. Uh, Right at the tip is the object that we're trying to remove. Now, we had a lot of difficulty here because some magnetic phenomena uh, was occurring. And uh, this object was being propelled away from the surgical instrument. And surgical instruments are not supposed to be uh, magnetic. It could be rather dangerous. You know, uh, so. You would think that if this was you know, ferrous metal and highly magnetic, it would just be attracted to it and almost come right out. But that's not the case. Next. Now, uh, here we put in uh, a needle. And uh, this needle runs uh, parallel to the skin. And it gives us uh, another uh, geographical architectural point to work from. Next. Here's the uh, needle again. And see, again, it's uh, pointing right to the object. Next. There it is. Looks like it's close to the surface of the skin. Not true. Next. This is it after it's been removed. And you can see that it's got kind of a, a curlicue thing that goes all the way around it. Uh, at first, I thought this was not covered with this uh, strange dark gray membrane. Well, when looking at it uh, under the microscope, uh, we found, uh, yep, there it is. Next. Now, uh, George was actually able to uh, interview the patient and uh, get some thoughts as the surgery was going on and after it was over. Next. 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 There it is. This is some tissue that we removed that surrounds uh, the object. We always do this because uh, we submit this for separate analysis. And in the past, uh, we had found that this uh, surrounding soft tissue absolutely has no inflammatory or rejection reaction whatsoever. 
Now, if we could uh, duplicate the membrane, as I've mentioned many times before, that surrounds this thing, my God, you could wrap a liver or a kidney or whatever you want in it, and the patient wouldn't have to take uh, things like cyclosporin and other uh, very expensive immunosuppressive agents for the rest of their life. Next. There's another view. Next. Next. Now, uh, under the optical microscope, you know, uh, in, in doing uh, research on, on either surgically removed objects or objects that may have something to do with abduction like Phyllis did with the uh, Betty Hill dress and so on, you, you can't walk into a laboratory and say, see, I have this thing. Here it is, guys. I want you to do what you're going to do and tell me what it is. Science doesn't work that way. Uh, there are a number of different tests, and so you have to be there to tell the laboratories what tests you want. And depending upon the conclusion of the first test, it depends on what you're going to do for the next test. And if you don't do that, the whole thing is a waste of time. And somebody was telling me uh, at this conference about a little uh, ball that supposedly came out of a nose and it was given to a lab and they didn't find out what it was. You can't do that. You have to know what test to order. So the way I look at things uh, is sort of in a practical aspect. Let's learn as much as we can from the outside surface and then we'll go deeper into it and see what it is. So the first thing we do is optical high magnification photography. Let's show that slide again. Next. And you can see it's a very, very shiny metal. Next. And it has grooves which run uh, 76 degrees parallel to the long axis uh, of the rod. And when the scientists uh, were looking at this, they said, uh, oh, this is probably a piece of extruded metal. That's what made the lines, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I probably even know the instrument that it was used to cut it off the stock with. Next. Next. And then we got to looking at the ends of the object, and we find that these lines totally cross the ends. And they said, whoops, there goes that theory. Because extruded objects, if you, you cut the thing off, the same lines don't go around the end. Next. Next. Okay, now uh, here's a, a report um, on uh, a sample uh, that was uh, given to me uh, by MUFON. And um, we, we started uh, doing the, the same sort of thing. Now, usually I, I don't accept surgical objects which are taken out by somebody else. But this case, uh, uh, John sent me all the material on a videotape and uh, the object and, and told me about the, uh, the abductee and uh, fairly well convinced me that this was a worthwhile case uh, to look into. Now, when I remove objects from the human body, uh, they're placed in a uh, serum solution. We, we take whole blood and then we spin it down and when we, when we spin the thing down, it separates out the liquid portion, which is the serum, and then that contains a, pres a preservative and an anticoagulant, and we pop the thing in there, and they, they're so far, knock on wood, and are as happy as clams. Uh, but this doctor didn't do that. I'm sure he was very well-meaning, so he put it in a solution of formaldehyde which is okay, uh, it didn't seem to deteriorate, so we went on uh, from there. Next. And uh, we, we got uh, several uh, reports back, uh, which I'll read you the last report, so just go on. Next. Now, uh, we did the optical uh, photography on this. Uh, you know, uh, with um, a microscope, a light microscope, and we got to looking at the outside, as you saw with the metallic rod, 
I didn't bring those uh, slides. That way, just have too many slides. Anyway, uh, that showed us what it looked like. Uh, but then we uh, subjected this to uh, the next bigness, biggest magnification, uh, which is an atomic force microscope. And I feel this is important because it's in between optical uh, photography and what you can get with uh, an SEM, which is scanning electron microscopy. So this gives us some idea of the, the surface data. And what happens, it uses a, uh, a laser and the laser travels either in a liquid or directly over the object and makes these lines, and it's comparable in a database to certain you know, known uh, graphic configurations. Next. So I'm going to show you some uh, examples under this tremendously high uh, magnification. This is not SEM. This is not scanning electron microscopy. Uh, this, this is uh, AFM, atomic force microscope. Next. Next. And you can see uh, it's almost like looking at the surface of another planet. We can see these striates, these large uh, protrusions, bumps. Next. And these are different views taken in different places. Uh, we did this on the surface of the rod or the surface of the elongated object, whatever you want to call it, and then we also took a look at the ends. Next. Now, uh, here's what the thing looked like on an SEM. This is scanning uh, electron microscopy. And when you do this, uh, you do another test. Uh, if you listened to Phyllis earlier, it's called an EDX. And EDX gives, gives you a graphic uh, uh, representation of the elements that uh, this is composed of. But what, this is what this uh, thing looked like. Now, when I played with this on the lab bench, uh, and I took an instrument to take it out of the formaldehyde and put it in a dish, it looked like it was magnetic. So I said, well, you know, maybe we really have something here. But uh, by the time we got it uh, you know, into a laboratory setting and started working with it, and we got it dried out, uh, we found that it had no magnetic properties whatsoever. So what was going on was what was called an electrostatic charge. Next. Now, we centered in on a small area of uh, the object where we saw this configuration, which looked like it was kind of an organic material. And uh, that's probably what it was. Next. And there's another view. Next. Now, this is kind of an interesting, we, interesting shot. We uh, turned it over and uh, used the uh, scanning electron microscope to take a look at the end. And as you can see, this is a hollow structure, and it's got stuff. I don't know how else to describe it. It's got stuff in it. You know, you're looking, you're looking at uh, many times mag magnification, as you can see here. And so it's, got, it's hollow, and it's got stuff in it. Next. And here's the other end, you know, and you can see again, it's, this is kind of irregular, and it's got some internal properties here, you know. What the heck is it? Next. And here's a really, really high magnification view, 500x here, uh, of an area of the surface. And this is where we saw that uh, place that looked like uh, organic material, which it probably was. Next. And here's a, a greater magnification shot of the end. You see, it's brown and it's hollow. And it's full of um, stuff. Yeah. OK, next. Now, here's a, a good shot of uh, the surface. This is uh, 500 times magnification. Or is that 3,500? Yeah, that's 3,500. You can see that's uh, all more highly magnified than uh, you've seen so far. <laughs> Let's put it that way. 3,500 times. And you can see that the surface is wavy, it's irregular, and there's some different uh, density of objects here. Next. And 
Next. Now, we say, well, what the heck? You know, what is this made of? My gosh. Well, look at this. Boop, 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 boop. Carbon. We got a lot of carbon in this thing. And then we took a look at some of the elements here and say, hmm, this certainly doesn't look metallic. It looks organic of some sort. Next. Then we took uh, another piece of the rod and uh, we did the ADX, EDX on it. And again, this uh, long carbon peak and you see the rest, the minor elements here. And hey, well, you know, this is getting to look more like something we might know what it is. Next. And here's another one. We did different places on the rod just in case you know, there's some place that's got something totally different, but same sort of stuff. Next. Different places again. Next. Now, uh, what we did, we looked at that and uh, the lab guys gathered around and said, you know, this looks like it could be cellulose. So, uh, Phyllis talked this morning about the infrared spectrometry, a test that's called FTIR, and I said, well, let's do that next. Now, you remember that when you walk into a laboratory, this was done by SEAL Labs in Southern California, and they're uh, very well qualified forensic laboratories. When there's an aircraft accident or something happens, you know, with NASA on the shuttle, they get these little pieces of metal and things, and they have to uh, come up with an analysis and a report of why the metal fractured and so on. So they're not, uh, they're not the caliber of a university laboratory with uh, one professor and a bunch of students who are trying to learn how to operate a machine. This, this is a real, true forensic laboratory. And you walk in through the front door and you say, this is what I want to have done. And we have group meetings and they make suggestions. Well, what about doing this and that? And then I say, well, let's see, let me get my checkbook out here. <laughs> well, I don't know, you know, they want $600 for this. Can you do it for four eighty-two fifty? dollars And, <laughs> you know, because we, we're a nonprofit, we don't have any money. Oh, no, we can't do it for that. All right, make it four eighty-five. I'll write the check right. So anyway, you can wheel and deal them. They're nice people. So, but it takes uh, money to do this next. So what we did, uh, this, uh, the FTIR uh, produces, uh, first of all, um, this graphic recording here. And then it uh, goes through a computer. Everything goes through a computer today. Uh, sometime in the future, I'll probably go through a computer. And I won't be standing here. It'll just be a virtual image of me. I'll be at home asleep or fishing someplace. <laughs> You know, this, this is modern science stuff. And also they looked at this configuration, looks pretty much the same. Hey, it's cellulose for sure. Uh, but what's this? This is uh, something different. Next. Next. So we did uh, some comparisons and uh, trying to find what these uh, other uh, areas are look like. Go ahead, next. And then uh, we did some more of them, and it began to look like certain amino acids. Now, isn't that strange? This thing comes out of the human body, and it could have amino acids there. How strange. Well, that's what we find in the, in the human body, amino acids. Next. Now, uh, here's the report, and uh, since it may not be that clear. I'll, I'll read it to you because this is the crux of the situation. Uh, this, as I said before, this, these tests cost me a lot of money. Here's what we got. Uh, material analysis of sample SEAL lab job number 20363. Dear Dr. Lear, the submitted sample was examined in a scanning electron microscope, SCM, and analyzed for elemental chemical composition with energy dispersive X-ray EDX microprobe attachment containing a thin window detector. The EDX microprobe, micro, 
microprobe spectra was obtained at 20 kilovolts electron beam voltage, condition that simultaneously detects all the elements in the periodic table above the atomic number five, which happens to be boron. Uh, the submitted sample was 3.25 millimeters in length, 0.45 millimeters in average diameter, had a black color with a lighter interior when examined from either end. The sample was non-magnetic. The side view of the sample was shown in figure 1A, which I showed you before. A small particle was present on the surface, shown in figure 1B, which is, as I said, probably organic material, tissue. The, the end-on views of the sample are shown in figures 2, 3A. A cellular structure is seen. Detailed examination of the sample surface revealed some linear features. Uh, the EDX microprobe spectra obtained on the small particles shown in figure one as represented in figure five, carbon, oxygen, calcium, sulfur, silicone, titanium, sodium, uh, zinc, traces of iron, potassium, aluminum were all present. And this is the normal stuff you usually find either in the human body or in a tree. The EDX microprobe spectra obtained on the small particles shown in 1B presented in figure five, um, et cetera, et cetera. And then we go on, EDX microprobe spectra obtained on both end views. General surface shown figures uh, two, three, four, brilliance, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, varying amounts of carbon, oxygen, calcium, sulfur, sodium, phosphorus were present. Uh, since the sample revealed large amounts of carbon and oxygen, it is primarily an organic material with some inorganic materials. To further characterize the organic nature of the sample, it was analyzed using a Fourier transform infrared FTIR microspectroscopy. In this technique, a small sample is irradiated with infrared in the spectral range of 700 to 4,000 minus centimeters, and the uh, radiation absorbed at each wave number is recorded. The presence of peaks at specific wave numbers indicate either a bond stretch or a bend, and thus indicative of the bond between the two specific atoms. So as Phyllis explained earlier, infrared spectroscopy is one of the most uh, conclusive and, and best tests that you can do at this stage of uh, looking at a piece of material. When these peaks are reviewed together, the functional groups composing the molecules presented are indicated. A Fourier transform indicates that all frequencies from the source are analyzed simultaneously. It looks at the whole piece at the same time. The FTIR spectrum obtained from the sample uh, and this best spectral match with the FTI li library revealed a cellulose material. Small amounts of protein and amino acids were present. In summary, the submitted sample is a long piece of wood showing linear features on the bark and cellular features inside the bark. The wood also contains some inorganic materials containing calcium, sulfur, sodium, and phosphorus. The sample surface contains small amounts of protein and amino acids from the body fluids. Please do not hesitate to contact me if you have further questions. So there you go. Lots of money spent, thorough investigation of an object, and we have a piece of wood. So uh, what does that mean uh, overall uh, with the case? Does that mean that there is no abduction? No. The abduction case could be as solid as possible. It's just that the object that this individual had within his body was a sliver. You know, and as I said, I didn't do the surgery. I received the object in formaldehyde and proceeded to do what uh, they wanted of me. So there it is. I mean, that's, that's the way a science is done. You don't always come up with uh, things like you saw in, in the video. But when you see material that is highly magnetic and when you do x-ray diffraction on it and the iron is amorphous, believe me, folks, we don't know how to do that stuff because I was in a black budget laboratory in San Antonio, Texas, and here were scientists that were crowded into the room and they confessed to me that we knew how to make amorphous metals. Naturally, they wouldn't tell me what it was used for, but you got to believe it was something military. 
But what they didn't know was how to make it magnetic. And if those guys don't know how to do it, we don't know how to do it, period. Okay, I, according to my big sign here, I, we have 13 minutes left, and I'll be happy to take some questions. So if we could have some lights, that would be nice. It's question time, but I'd like to have the lights on so I can see who's asking the question. Yeah. All right. But maybe they won't turn. I don't know. Did I beat you? Okay. Yeah, well, thanks a lot. That was great. Very interesting. I'm going to go out and buy your book. But I just wondered, uh, this is hard, it seems like, at least some elements of hard evidence. What kind of response have you had from your folks in San Antonio or U.S. government, military intelligence, it, because this is hard evidence. Have you had any kind of reaction, response, or anything else? Thanks. You know, I think my best uh, answer to that question is, uh, why is it I, I do what I do and I'm not uh, locked up or uh, you know, put in jail or found on the bottom of the sea yet? And it's uh, probably what I'm discovering is you know, somebody knows, some group knows, and, and you guys out there may know more about this than I do, certainly. But there may be groups who know a lot more than any of us sitting in this room. And I think if you don't tilt the scale uh, grossly, you know, I'm not coming out and said, you know, I just shook hands with a gray last night and we sat on my porch and smoked cigars. <laughs> you know, if I did that, might be in real trouble. But. When you go into a black budget laboratory, and these are very sincere guys, and incidentally, the, the laboratory director, when this was going on, was standing out on the hall with his hands on his hips, and the expression on his face was not exactly friendly, because these guys are on a payroll to do a job for the government, not to go in a room looking at a little piece of UFO junk. Next. Right. So uh, my name is Joe Brooks from LA MUFON. I'm an internal medicine doctor. And it, the analysis that you did at the end of the program was not from a specimen that you had personally obtained. Is that, that was the point of information? That's correct. And I received uh, the specimen in a container of formaldehyde with a letter from the physician who removed it and a videotape of the of the surgery. They did not have uh, x-rays that showed metallic density like you did in your previous cases, right? No, I had no x-rays to go on at all. I accepted mm -hmm. it just on the merit that uh, Muffon thought it was a good case, and then after going over it personally, I thought, yes, uh, it's worthy doing. And so you're going to modify your practice in the future in terms of uh, uh, focusing on things you've removed yourself that you can vouch for, is that right? Not necessarily, because Joe, uh, in the last two years particularly, I've received stuff from Australia, from Japan, from Israel, and a few other places. And they're not uh, surgical specimens. They're materials of interest. And as long as I can keep a few you know, bucks to do the test, I do them and I send them back the results. So well, you know, I started out by just doing the surgical stuff. But this has sort of evolved now into other physical evidence either of you know UFO landing crash sites or you know somebody sees something strange and a piece falls off and it looks weird and I get it and as long as there's enough documentation you know I, and I have the bucks I can you know, go ahead and do it thank you so much thank you Joe is there any reason other than uh, uh, speculation is there speculation on why the implants are put in other than maybe a tracking device? And uh, could it be detrimental to take them out? Well, that's a, a, a good question, and I've been asked that uh, quite frequently. I've been in 42 countries, and I probably have had that question asked in uh, many of them. Now, all I can go by, number one, uh, answering the last part first, is it detrimental? We follow the cases uh, quite closely for the ones that we have uh, extracted. And nobody's really had anything detrimental uh, that happened to them. One case, they thought they had some psychic ability, which disappeared. But within two months, it came back. And also, uh, so far, knock on wood, we've never had anybody had one put back. Now, are tracking devices, or what are they for? I really don't think that they're tracking devices. And, and uh, I wish Stan Friedman was here, because uh, 
I would like to use his a little uh, acronym for uh, SETI, which is the most stupid thing I've ever heard of in my life. Why, why would you expect an advanced civilization to be playing with a radio wave? I mean, uh, Mish Yukaku, you know, gives a, a, a good uh, analogy of various, uh, you know, advanced civilizations. And you think of an advanced civilization would have to, you know, stick something like we do in a whale to track it through the ocean. Uh, another thing, in Brazil, I was presented with a case, a lady had an object, well, two objects in the toe, very similar to the one that I removed in 1995. And she was deathly afraid to have this removed. And I said, why are you so afraid? Because you have one here that's slightly dangerous. It's getting very close to the surface of the skin, and it could form a canal if it came out, and you could wind up with an osteomyelitis of the bone. It'd be an open trackway to the bone. And she says, well, let me tell you this, Doc. She said, in one of my experiences, they stopped an insect in midstream, stopped it with a little pinpoint blue light, and they told her they could find that insect anywhere on this planet they wanted to find it. So do you really think that an advanced civilization needs a glob to use as a tracking device? I don't think so. And as to what they are doing there, you know, maybe they're monitoring something. Maybe they're monitoring our genetics. We know that in large, the abduction phenomena involves the taking of sperm and egg. J, uh, David Jacobs thinks there's a hybrid program. There could very well be. But maybe we're being genetically manipulated. So maybe they're following that. Who knows? Anybody that has the answers that gets up before you in an audience like this and thinks they have the answers and starts telling you, put a finger in each ear and run out the room. No, we don't know. Yes. Based on your last comment, do you think that uh, our genetics are dynamic as well as um, there seems to be no evidence of scars from an external insertion? Is that a common phenomenon that you see? Yes. Uh, in all of the cases, uh, other than the ones that we did for uh, scoop mark surgeries, uh, which were uh, two in number, none of them had any kind of a portable entry. And believe me, we. We look quite closely. We use the loop, and then we, if it's in the foot, we cover the whole leg looking for somewhere where it could have gone in and migrated. We haven't found any scar. And how about, how about the dynamics of our uh, DNA? Of our genetics? Yes. We're learning more and more uh, all the time. Uh, we know that uh, DNA now not only uh, does what it does, but it has an electronic signature. So, you know, if we could develop uh, a mechanical electronic device, uh, I could find you wherever I wanted. I wouldn't have to put an implant in you to find you. So, yes, and, and can it change? Yes, it can change. It is dynamic. Thank you. Next. He, he had nearly the same question I did, but I'll take it a little further. Are you in contact with any groups or individuals uh, studying the quantum capabilities of DNA? And have you seen any evidence of this in your studies of the uh, implants? Now, there's a Cleve Baxter sort of thing. I uh, am quite fortunate in uh, uh, being friends with a, a DNA researcher, one of the finest in the world. I, he's also the one uh, that worked on some of the stuff with Betty Hill's dress. And uh, we're learning more and more about the DNA and and various things all the time. It's, it's totally uh, ongoing. Uh, hello, Dr. Lear. Uh, Bill Konkleski of Michigan MUFON. I had a question also about scarring. Um, you said that in most of the cases there haven't been any um, scarring from the insertion of these objects. Has there been a real detailed study on people who have scars to check to see if they may also have implants? Good question. Yes. I get numerous, numerous, numerous emails and phone calls and et cetera. And when I go to conferences, there's people that come up that do have a scar and think they might have an object. And my advice to them is go have a plain, simple x-ray taken. You know, what, uh, what's a few uh, Rankin's going to do in the face of the environment that we live in? I <laughs> make that much difference. Get a plain, simple x-ray taken and see if anything shows up. Next. Two questions, if I could. 
Um, have you ever considered a very fine needle insertion? I mean, you're looking for a scar, but a fine needle wouldn't leave a track for, per se. Uh, you're absolutely right. A fine needle wouldn't leave much uh, um, uh, to, uh, to find afterwards. However, when you uh, find like a T-shaped object, which is only, uh, which is a sonometer in each direction, I don't think you're gonna have a needle big enough to put that in the body. Okay. So size precludes the insertion with some kind of a needle. Okay, second question. Most of the things you're showing us is soft tissue. Have you had any experience with this being embedded in like bone? Uh, no, I have not found any of these so far embedded in bone. Now the one uh, that I, the case that I talked about with an object in the neck and one in the maxilla, you know, maybe that'll be a case where, where there will be something in bone. But that's why it's so important uh, to do a CAT scan because a CAT scan can tell you precisely where the object is. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, two questions. Uh, one was, uh, have you had uh, a lot of or noticed many of the implants being what Bud Hopkins describes as being like the little BB inserted up the nose or uh, in, the, in the area of brain? Uh, I have uh, seen photos of objects that uh, were reported to come out of the nose, but uh, nobody has been able to uh, successfully get one to me to, to analyze. I would love to get one. Okay. You know, and there's so many people that have reported this. I mean, they got to be around. And then my que second question is, has there been any one or two common themes structurally that are true in all implants? You've described the structures of a metallic core with a black sheath around it. Has that been the case in all of them, or have there been you know, some that ha don't? And we, uh, we have four now that are metallic objects covered with a strange uh, membrane that are little cantaloupe seed-shaped devices. Uh, the other metallic ones, uh, one is triangular, one is T-shaped. Uh, they are also covered with the same uh, strange membrane, but uh, differ um, in, in shape. And we got one minute remaining, so I might have time for one more question. I think we can interject another. Have you uh, had, you said there was the tissue around the, around the sheath was highly enervated. And have you, were you able to ascertain if that was connected to the nervous system in some way or? Yes, it's connected to the nervous system because it's like a, you know, a radio. You unplug the thing and it don't work anymore. The minute these things have been taken out of the body, that's it. They don't work. Don't do anything. Okay, let's try one more question. Uh, yes, doctor. Uh, you made a uh, point, a strong point about the absence of inflammatory uh, cells. Uh, could you expand upon that and just how rare that would be with objects in the human body? Okay, it is extremely rare and virtually impossible. You cannot get foreign material inside the human body without having a reaction in the form of inflammation. The body wants to reject or get rid of the object that it's in there. And there's a whole scenario of inflammation with increased blood supply, increased number of white cells, uh, phagocytic development in order to try and remove the object. Finally, it can't be removed. You get fibrosis that uh, goes around the object, such as what happened in the pilots that were involved in war actions and had shrapnel that stayed in their body for 20 years. The, it's there, it's called a chronic inflammatory reaction. It becomes walled off and acts like it's not there. And I thank you so very much for your kindness and your attention. And if anybody wants a book, I'll be out there. Thank you so much. Oops, oops, oops.